Hello. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Do please continue coming in. I think there are a few seats left. Um, uh, thank you so much for coming uh, today. My name is, uh, is Ralph. Uh, I'm the creative director at Playground Games uh, in the UK. We're an independent uh, UK developer. You might know us from such games as Forza Horizon, Forza Horizon 2, and Forza Horizon 3, which came out uh, last year, last September. Um, this is my 20th year in the, in the video games industry, which is amazing. Um, in that time, I have worked on, I've worked on some good games, I've worked on some okay games. If I'm honest, I've worked on a couple of genuinely terrible games, uh, which I will not mention today. Uh, last year, I was fortunate to be able to work with an incredibly great team uh, playground uh, on one of the great games, which are uh, often the, the, the rare pleasure of working in this industry, and it's that game. Uh, I want to talk to you about um, today. The, um, the background, incidentally, is uh, from our Hot Wheels expansion, um, which came out last week. That's just a shameless plug more than anything else. I'm not going to talk about it today, um, but if you haven't checked it out, please do feel uh, free to do so. Um, it is easily the most ridiculous thing uh, we've ever done. Um, and it currently has a 92 Metacritic, which is uh, uh, almost equally as ridiculous. Um, so that's, uh, that's Hot Wheels, but I'm not going to talk about that today. I want to talk to you today um, about first impressions. Um, and this is a quote that I thought um, was a good starting point. All good talks start with either a quote or a dic dictionary definition. Mine starts with a quote. I wonder if anybody knows who said, you never get a second chance to make a first impression. It sounds kind of Oscar Wilde or Mark Twainy. Um, it was, in fact, Will Rogers. Yeah. Uh, me neither. Apparently, he didn't do very much or say very much else apart from that, but that's the thing that's gone down in history attributed to him, and it's got that kind of combination, uh, hasn't it, of uh, clever wordplay um, and also an intuitive uh, truthfulness um, that I think has, is what's made it a, a saying that has continued um, since the mid-20th century when apparently he first said it. You never get a second chance uh, to make a first impression, and I, get we, I think we all get that, right? Because we like to make a good first impression. Um, it's nice to make a, a good first impression. Um, some interesting things. Let's do a little bit of psychology about first impressions. Um, humans make their first impression and form their first uh, opinion incredibly quickly. Um, you will almost certainly have formed a first uh, impression uh, of me. Uh, we apparently decide whether we like someone or whether we want to do business with them uh, within the first three seconds uh, of meeting them. When we look at a website, we have formed an opinion of that web page uh, within the first 50 milliseconds. 50 milliseconds. The human brain is incredibly adept uh, at what psychologists call thin slicing. Uh, we thin slice information and we form uh, often lasting and often very accurate impressions from a very thin slice uh, of information. And it's a handy trick to have, I guess, because we meet uh, so many people and interact with so many things on a daily basis. Uh, the human brain is just uh, getting ahead of things for you. Um, so yes, that's, that's pretty interesting. I said that they're accurate. There are some studies that show that uh, opinions formed within seconds match up pretty robustly with opinions formed over a longer period of time. Um, the other aspect of psychology which makes uh, it likely that a first impression will last um, is something else entirely. You will have heard of confirmation bias. Confirmation bias basically says um, that we humans don't like to be wrong. Uh, when we form an opinion, we like that opinion to be right. What the brain does subconsciously uh, is select evidence that supports uh, that opinion. Uh, and it will also subconsciously um, throw away any evidence which uh, contradicts it. We are all doing this every single day. It's happening at a subconscious level. And all of that means that making a first impression or making a good first impression isn't just a nice thing to do. It can be an incredibly important thing to do if we're doing business, if we're meeting people, if we're hoping to impress people, because first impressions last and they're often accurate. And even if they weren't accurate, they're often very difficult uh, to overturn. So what does this have to do with games? Uh, because it's games that I'm going to talk to you about today, specifically Forza Horizon 3, and specifically the very first 10 minutes uh, of that game, because it's creating a first impression, or a great first impression that we set out to do with the first 10 minutes of that game. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit uh, today about how we, how we did that. 
what happens if you don't make a good first impression with your game. Um, in the most ex extreme cases, uh, your player will stop playing. That happens a surprising amount. I work in AAA uh, console games. Um, even in console games, even when people are paying a $60 price tag, they disappear from the first 10 minutes of games uh, with surprising uh, regularity. Uh, between 10 and 20% of players in the Forza Horizon series, that's one, two, and three, um, don't get to the first achievement. Uh, and literally, all you have to do to get that achievement is drive a car for a bit. Um, between 10 and 20% uh, of our players do not get there. And in case you're thinking that it's a thing about um, racing games, perhaps, or even uh, my games, um, it applies equally to other genres. If you played Bioshock Infinite, um, as I'm sure many of you did a couple of years ago, you'll know um, that very early in the game, you will go up in a lift and ascend to the, the stunning cloud city of, uh, of Columbia, and there's an achievement for that. It's the very first achievement in the game. 27% of players on Xbox One did not get that achievement. Where did they go? Um, it's a mystery to me. Uh, over 30% of players uh, of Minecraft on Xbox One never open their inventory, um, which is you know, something you have to do during the tutorial. I'm not aware of a way to play Minecraft without uh, utilizing your tutorial. So across all genres in this game, of course, if you're making uh, mobile games, your percentages, I imagine, are much higher, and good luck with that. Um, but in console games, um, a large percentage of players don't get very far in the game at all. But that's not the section of players that I want to talk to you about today. It's the rest. It's the, the people who stay that I want to talk about, because um, there's psychology at work here. Uh, and there is uh, some interesting learnings that we've uh, made over the years in this area. Uh, and it comes down to this. First impressions change how players perceive a game. And that's not just how they perceive the opening of the game, the first few minutes. The impressions they form, the opinions they form during the first few minutes of a game um, change how they view everything uh, thereafter. A good start to a game, a good first impression, creates a halo effect around everything uh, that follows. If you start with great visuals, a great fun experience, you really engage the player, they'll forgive some of the flaws. Uh, that come afterwards, they will view that differently. Uh, and conversely, if your first impression is not great, if you don't uh, open with your, your, your best content, you're fighting an uphill battle from that point on um, to try and win them back because their brains are telling them that this is a, a bad game, just as the people who had a good first impression, their brains are telling them this is a good game and their brains are subconsciously selecting things from the game that will confirm that uh, opinion to them. We did a... Um, did a bit of a study in Forza a couple of years ago, um, which illustrates exactly this point. Um, we put two uh, groups of test subjects um, into uh, a testing scenario. Uh, we gave them both broadly the same uh, content, uh, an opening race, uh, and then the first hour of the game uh, in question. The only thing we changed was that for one group, um, we made them race the first race in a fairly ordinary car. I don't actually remember what it was. It's fairly ordinary, nothing terrible about it, but nothing great uh, either. Uh, the second group uh, got to race in the, what was then brand new Ferrari, uh, 458 Italia, Incre incredible car, incredible looking, incredible sounding, uh, a joy to drive. And after that first race, we asked them their impressions, not just of the car, but of the, the experience they'd had. And guess what? The people in the Ferrari rated the game higher for visuals, for fun, for intent to play again uh, than the people uh, who did not have the Ferrari. That's not um, a particularly mind-blowing uh, outcome. But then we, we made both of the, the groups play the remaining uh, the remainder of the first hour, and the content was identical. There was nothing different from that point. And we stopped them at the end of the first hour, and we asked them the same set of questions. And you've probably uh, guessed where I'm going with this. What we found is that the people who had started in the Ferrari, but then uh, played exactly the same uh, hour as the other group, still rated the game overall uh, much higher uh, for fun, for beauty, for audio, and for intent uh, to play a game uh, than the um, the people who did not start in the Ferrari. So that first impression changes the way people think about and perceive the game from that point on. And that's kind of the thinking that we've employed um, on Forza Horizon 3, not just in terms of the car that we're going to start players in, but in terms of every aspect of the experience um, that we give them at the start, because we want to create uh, a great first impression 
um, and that, that first impression will then be carried by them through the rest of the game. Uh, I'm going to throw up a couple of takeaways just as we go through. There's four in all. The first one is basically exactly what I've been saying. We use the phrase, put your best foot forward. Um, and that sounds like kind of a duh, obvious thing to say. Of course, you're going to put your best foot forward. But it actually, uh, it requires some commitment. Um, because what you need to do is ask yourself, um, have I started my game? Have I created my first impression with the absolute best my game can be? Am I showing my best content, my best visuals, my best audio? Am I showing the best um, gameplay experience that my game has to offer? right at the start. And if you are, then great. But we know, I think you're all thinking, so many games don't do that. Um, I wonder if I could get this screen back, guys. Um, so we're putting our best uh, foot forward. OK. Um, yeah. So there's a bunch of things that you might, uh, as a designer, uh, think about doing right at the start of the game. You might be thinking about um, tutorializing, because that's a completely legitimate thing uh, to do right at the start of the game. You might be thinking about scene setting. Uh, you might be thinking about explaining uh, the narrative of the game and the player's position within the narrative. Um, all of those things are completely legitimate things to do. But again, the essence of the philosophy of putting your best foot forward um, is that you're asking yourself if that is more important um, than the tutorial, than the narrative scene setting. And if it, if it is, if you believe it is, then you will either, one, do something really cool to integrate your tutorial, for example, right into the fabric of the game. You're going back to things like Halo's classic uh, inverted Y-axis tutorial, which was integrated right into the narrative of the game, or Metal Gear Solid V's uh, incredibly well-integrated character customization tutorial. Um, and if you're not doing that, if you're not investing that level of polish um, in, into your tutorials, then you're moving out uh, of the start of your game uh, entirely. So we ask ourselves in the studio, and this is something we've pushed right down to all of our, our team members, when we're thinking about the opening to our game, we're thinking about the initial experience, um, are we putting our best foot forward? Uh, and that's something that stood us in really good stead. Um, on the initial experience of Forza Horizon 3, um, you might use different terms. I've heard loads, lots of different terminology for, uh, for what we call initial experience, just for clarity. What we refer to as initial experience is basically the, the period from the very start of the game um, up to about the, on Forza Horizon, the three and a half hour mark. Um, that's the, the point at which we had um, introduced everything and said everything to the player that we needed to say before we let them loose in the open world and the game systems that populate it. Um, you might call it the first time user experience. I've heard it called um, a bunch of other things by different studios. That's what we mean by initial experience. Um, we also talk about the, the, the very initial experience, which is the first hour. Uh, and today, I'm going to talk to you about the first 10 minutes. And on Forza Horizon 3, we made a decision really early in the day. Um, one, that we were going to plan our initial experience um, right from the start of the project, uh, and two, that we were going to make the first 10 minutes of our game, not just the first 10 minutes of our game, uh, but also our E3 show floor demo uh, as well. Uh, and that obviously has uh, great benefits in that we're getting two for the price of one. It also has huge um, complications as well in that it brings everything forward uh, and puts uh, E3 as an incredibly important milestone in the development of our game, which for your reference kind of runs uh, for two years on, on Forza Horizon 3, from the end of Forza Horizon 2 back in uh, September, October 2014, uh, right the way through to September uh, of last year. Um, and it took us 18 months of that two-year period uh, to build, to plan, and to build the first 10 minutes of the game. I'm going to show you how we did that uh, over the next uh, 20 or so minutes. Um, we had some objectives under this putting our best foot forward um, umbrella. Uh, first of all, deliver our best visuals, audio, and gameplay uh, first. And as I've said, that requires you to be pretty precise and honest with yourself about what exactly the best part of your game is. Um, we had an objective that we wanted to showcase the beauty and diversity of Australia. Australia is the setting for the game, if you're not familiar with it. Um, that objective came um, from, I think, feedback from the previous game. Uh, Forza Horizon 2, which was set in, uh, in France and in Italy, uh, and although beautiful, had a tendency to be a little bit visually samey. Uh, and we chose Australia to, uh, to counteract that. 
We chose Australia because it has an incredible diversity uh, of environments and ecotypes, and we wanted to make sure we communicated that to the player, not through the game, but through the first uh, five to ten minutes uh, of gameplay. And then obviously you want to showcase what's new to the game, particularly when you're making uh, a sequel, a numbered sequel. You want to make sure that your player is aware that there is new value and new fun to be had in the game. So those were the three objectives that we took uh, into uh, the planning process, which began uh, back in February 2015. So we had just exited the concept phase. We were starting in pre-production. Um, and the first thing we did was determine what this first 10 minutes would be. And that goes back to determining what the best uh, gameplay, the best visuals, the best uh, audio uh, in our game is. For us, the best experience in a Horizon game is driving a great car really fast down a road. Uh, at its core, Horizon is about having fun uh, in cars with your friends in an open world. Um, and the best experience for us isn't necessarily racing uh, or drifting or doing stunts. Um, it's the pure thrill of driving an amazing car uh, down the road. So we decided that the first portion of our first 10 minutes would be uh, an initial drive. Uh, and then we decided that we would move on to uh, what we call on Horizon a showcase event. And if you're not familiar with Horizon, showcase events are as close to a signature event as I think we have uh, in the series. Uh, they're where we pit you uh, against not other cars, not other competitors, uh, but uh, other vehicles entirely. Uh, in this case, uh, a dual rotor helicopter, but in the past we've put you against uh, a train uh, or a Mustang fighter, um, or an aerial stunt team, to name uh, just a few. They're kind of inspired by the, uh, the show Top Gear, back, back when it was good. Um, and if you're familiar with that, then you'll know the kind of over-the-top, for-the-camera spectacle um, that we, uh, we were going for uh, back in the first horizon, and we've really made it our own. So we decided that the second part of the first 10 minutes should be one of these showcase events, but not just any showcase event. We decided, uh, because we're ambitious, uh, to make it the best, the most complicated, the most spectacular uh, showcase event that we'd ever done. And that, to us, looked like a pretty decent 10 minutes, combining, as it does, that core Horizon experience and something that only we do, that's something that nobody else does, and that felt good as something that we would show not, to, not just to players when they bought the game, but also to people uh, when we announced the game for the first time at E3. So we're an open world game. If you're, if you're not familiar with Horizon, we're an open world game, which brings with it, uh, if you work in open world games, you will understand many complications, um, which you wouldn't have in a level-based or a track-based game. Um, so in March, we, um, we were at the stage where we had drawn our, our world map uh, in 2D. Uh, for the first time. We understood where the different ecotypes were, and Australia has many, uh, from the outback to the rainforest to the rolling fields down to the coast. Tons and tons of uh, uh, environmental diversity there. We understood where all those ecotypes sat within our, uh, in our world map. What we then started to do was decide what this initial drive route would be, uh, and we created a bunch of one-sheets just like this one. I think we had about 22 in total uh, during this phase, which specified different routes through our world um, that we could take uh, and also pointed out the great things, the visual moments, the wow moments, if you will, um, that we would be uh, experiencing uh, as we went through. Uh, we picked this one. Um, we made sure it fitted into our initial install chunk, which if you, you work on Xbox One, you'll be familiar with. If you don't, do not worry about it one bit. Um, and then we started uh, to create some concepts. Now, this was before we'd even done on-the-ground re uh, reference research in Australia, so we're working from internet research, uh, Google image images and what have you, and we created some, uh, some images to get the team excited about where we're going to be going from the out, uh, out back at dawn, down some quintessential Australian roads, meeting up with some cars, down towards a dam, uh, over a rickety bridge into the rainforest, uh, through a bioluminescent cave, um, and down onto the beach of the Twelve Apostles, which was one of the things, one of the locations that really sold us in Australia right back at the start of the project. And then arriving at the Horizon Festival as it's being built, because the, the idea behind Horizon 3 is that you are the boss of the Horizon Festival and this is yours um, to direct. Uh, and then what we did a couple of months later is in our original white box, um, we plotted out this route. Now, this is the first stage of world building in a Horizon game. We take the world map and we start to build it in 3D, and it looks uh, terrible. Uh, but then at uh, intervals along the route, we created these target concepts of what we wanted uh, the route to look like. Um, now, you'll notice, actually, and if, if you're familiar with Horizon, you'll know this isn't the car that you would drive at the start of, uh, of 3. 
Um, but at the point we made this, we didn't know that. So we just used the hero car, which is a Lamborghini uh, from Horizon 2. Here we get this shot of the, the outback there. Um, the decision to use the Lamborghini Centenario, which is the hero car we ended up with, wasn't made too much later because I don't think Lamborghini had even thought of the Lamborghini Centenario um, at this point uh, in time. So again, here we come uh, down to a, a right-hander onto the rickety bridge. The rainforest here depicted by three uh, red lollipop trees uh, and over the bridge. And what we used, as I'm sure you guys will be familiar with as well, um, used these concepts for, uh, was first informing our team and the wider organization that this is what we were going to be building for the first five minutes of the game. Uh, and then we used it as a reference point so that um, as we went on, we, we went to Australia, we did lots of location research. Uh, and as our environment team started to build this environment uh, and build the assets that would populate it, um, we knew what we were aiming for. And our goal was to match these, uh, these concepts uh, as well as we possibly could. So I'm going to skip ahead from this video. Uh, let's go back to the first one. I'm going to show you how we, how we turned out, uh, how we scored against our, our concept. So this is the very first one, basically the first time you get control of the, of the car in the game. This was the, uh, this was the shot that we, uh, uh, the paint over that our concept artist created. Uh, and then this is it in the game. And I think we did pretty well with this one. We matched it pretty closely. Um, you know, we were pretty pleased with this. This one, not so much, and there's an interesting story, I guess, why. Uh, the idea here was that we were going to show the mountains in the distance of the, uh, the outback. Um, it didn't turn out like that, uh, and it kind of feels like maybe we just didn't follow the concept well enough. Um, what actually happened here was the, the change in car completely changed the route. Uh, this car is much, much faster than the one that we uh, originally prototyped with. Um, so as you can see, it's not that the mountains have sunk, it's this road has actually uh, been cambered considerably. We've added in a guardrail because people tended to fly off into the, into the outback at this point. And here, gameplay trumped visuals uh, in terms of uh, that first impression that we wanted to create. Um, over the rickety bridge, which looks great here, uh, looks pretty different here, I guess. I mean, the, the bridge is much, uh, much wider. Again, that's a gameplay consideration. And if you're thinking about putting the, the pad in people's hands on the show floor at E3, you really want this uh, to be as drivable as possible, hence the width uh, of the bridge. And then also the trees aren't quite as, uh, as dense as they were in the concept. Uh, ditto here. Um, the rainforest turned out to be one of our most tricky uh, ecotypes within the game uh, with such dense foliage, so many trees, so much overdraw. It was a real performance and memory uh, problem for us right up until uh, pretty close to E3. Um, this one's interesting. The intent of this, uh, this shot is that we wanted to show the player Surfer's Paradise, which is the sort of skyscraper-y type things there uh, in the background. Um, you're not going to get to Surfer's Paradise when you play the game for a good couple of hours, but we wanted to make sure that the player knew it was there and that they could go there. So we set this shot up to show it in the distance. Um, Arguably, this concept doesn't do a great job because the, the, uh, the guardrail is kind of obscuring it a little bit. I think we did a better job with it here, uh, dipping the road slightly so that we have a better unbroken view of the skyscrapers in the distance and then drawing the player's eye to it with the helicopter um, as well. And here's the first big change from what we originally planned in our IE. Um, and again, it came about because of the, the, the car choice or the change in car choice which happened uh, during that first year of de development. The idea of this shot is that it shows off the bay, uh, Byron Bay for the first time, the sea uh, and the beautiful uh, coastline. Um, but I'll show you what happened. Um, Basically, this car um, was far, far too fast uh, to then take down onto the beach and drive on the beach. So we made the decision that we were going to swap for the player uh, and swap him into a more suitable car, uh, in this case, a, a big truck. Uh, so that's exactly what we did. Um, and from now on, this, uh, this experience uh, is not in a Lamborghini at all, but it's in, it's in a truck. Um, but that, experience, that, uh, that change actually, I think, really benefited um, not just the playability of the first 10 minutes, uh, it also benefited the sense of variety uh, that the, the first 10 minutes showed. So players were actually experiencing three different cars um, during this uh, period. Again, all pretty close. We changed a lot uh, about the bioluminescent cave. A bioluminescent cave is a cave with glowworms, basically. Uh, and it does exist. This is, uh, does exist in, uh, in Australia. Uh, but if you didn't know that, you might be forgiven for thinking it was a scene from Halo or something. So we actually toned it right down uh, in the final game. 
Uh, and it was a great uh, showcase for the global illumination system that we'd also put in for this game. Uh, and then bursting out onto the beach, um, this is different, this is broadly similar. The Beach of the Twelve Apostles uh, is a stunning landmark in Australia, and as I say, it was one of the, one of the places that really inspired us when we, we started looking at it. Um, I guess these concepts show up the limitations of the, the paint-over concept uh, process. Um, we actually moved the sun way out there. This looks like a beautiful concept shot, but if you actually analyze it, there's literally no way the back faces of those uh, sandstone pillars could be lit by the sun. So what actually happened when we got it into engine is that the beach was completely uh, bathed in dark shadows and there was no detail in it at all. Uh, so what we did was uh, stick the, the sun way out there to the left. Uh, we got shadows playing across the beach um, and some beautiful contrast and some god rays. Uh, as you fly down there. And that was the end of the initial drive. Uh, at this point, we're going to take away uh, control from the player. Um, and we're going to move into the second part um, of, the, um, of the opening 10 minutes. The takeaway from this, and it's going to sound incredibly uh, obvious, is plan early and iterate often. That's a great thing to say. It's a much harder thing to do. And I think um, those of you who, who make games here uh, will understand that. Planning something early uh, is easy, but iterating it is the hard part. Making sure you revisit it every milestone, every sprint, however you organize your production, um, to make sure that what you planned early still relates to the game that you're making at that point. We did that basically on a monthly basis. Um, it changed in small ways. It changed in one large way, as I described with the car. Um, but it was that iteration process that allowed us to execute pretty much what we planned um, at the end of the day. Um, and I'm going to move on to the second part, which is a perfect example of us not planning early and not iterating often. Uh, the second part of the, uh, the opening 10 minutes is the, uh, the, the showcase. And for showcases, well, let me explain what showcases are. This is one from our Fast and Furious expansion for Horizon 2, where you race a helicopter, one from one, racing a biplane. It basically makes you race against um, a completely different type of vehicle. Uh, and they're fun, and they're deliberately over the top, and they're not to be taken seriously. Many people do complain to me that, um, that uh, they feel that the vehicles are rubber banded um, because they always end up finishing just at the same time of them. That is, of course, deliberate. Um, you can't race planes. It just doesn't work. Um, this is all about having fun. This is all about spectacle. Uh, the, the train from Horizon 2. What we had the idea for in this one in June 2015 um, was this dual rotor helicopter, and I'm not allowed to use the brand name because it's definitely not that brand. Um, in particular, um, in particular, that top left image uh, of uh, the dual rotor helicopter swinging a Jeep beneath it, that really caught our imagination. We'd done helicopters before, but we'd never done a helicopter swinging a Jeep beneath it. Uh, and that's what came up with the, that's where we came up with the idea that you would be racing the Jeep, but then right at the start of the race, it would be winched up onto a helicopter. It would swing the, the Jeep along the, the route of the, um, the showcase, and right at the last minute, it would drop the Jeep in front of you, and you would race to the finish against the newly dropped Jeep. Um, it sounded really cool. It sounds kind of fun. Um, it also sounded incredibly difficult uh, to do, and so it proved. Um, in December, we mapped out the route. These are some screenshots from it. Um, not a lot needs to be said about that, to be honest, apart from it wasn't very good. Um, but in the heat of production, with everything moving at an incredible pace, we didn't really catch that. It wasn't until April um, that we came back to look at it and realized um, that not only was it not very good, that route wasn't going to serve our purposes. It didn't reflect the world that we were building or much further along in building. Um, so we threw it away. And takeaway uh, number three is that sometimes you just have to chuck stuff away. Sometimes no amount of polish um, will save something. Um, but throwing something away, particularly when you're on a tight deadline or a tight schedule, when you have limited resources, uh, is a very difficult thing to do. It means telling somebody who's done some work that it's just not good enough and that it can't really be brought up to the level it was required and we're going to have to scrap it. It means uh, throwing away some schedules. It means causing some scheduling pain to a bunch of people, not just one. Um, but I would say that there are times um, when you have to make that decision and it's for the best. Um, and you should look around your team because there needs to be somebody there who has, I guess, the authority and I guess the guts uh, to make that kind of decision. Um, and if you're looking around your team and you don't see that person, well, it might be you. Um, and that would be my advice. Sometimes you just have to start over. Uh, knowing when is the trick. Uh, so in April, we started over on this helicopter showcase. 
we started at the, uh, at the lighthouse at the top of Byron Bay. Uh, we wound down the hill. We went through the sea, up into the rainforest, splashing through ponds. Um, we went over a huge jump. We had an idea that just before the end, there would be a huge jump. It would be a really epic moment. Players would um, we would say wow if players actually ever do say wow. Um, and then we would race to the finish. As you can see, these are super early. We didn't even have the Jeep model. That's just a null car. As you can see, the... Um, uh, the Jeep is just sort of suspended beneath the, the helicopter. We hadn't quite worked out how to make it swing. Um, but we loved this route, and it really did um, what we wanted uh, it to do. So one of our, or our lead animator, Harry, started working on how he was going to make this Jeep swing beneath the helicopter. Um, Jerking is the product of a laptop. This is not Harry's animation. He's not that bad. Um, <laughs> what he did, and it's really clever, um, because we didn't have... Um, cloth simulation or physics within the engine. It wasn't something we'd ever needed um, before. So what he did uh, was take the helicopter's motion path from the game, uh, import it into Maya, and then bake out the cloth simulation uh, within Maya. And then he baked that down into a simple animation, which then went back into the game um, and gave us uh, the final animation. And the Jeep swings really pretty satisfyingly. And you see the cords buckle uh, as they go slack and, uh, and then are weighted down uh, again and this is the big jump I was talking about. Again, uh, the, the jerking is not author's own. Um, so this is the, this is the jump uh, when we first planned out the route. And in all honesty, it is a really big jump. If you were to take the camera around to the side, you would see it's a huge old jump. Um, but when your camera is right locked to the back of the, the buggy that we're, uh, we're driving, it doesn't seem that way. Um, and what we did was we set up a, a mini team. And the mini team's job was to take that jump and make it awesome. Um, and we did that across the game, but I'm using this as an example because this is what we came up with. It goes into slow-mo, the dude in the, the Jeep air punches. You can't hear it because the sound's not working, um, but the Jeep lands on the beat of the music uh, and the race continues. Um, they did a bunch of work. What you might think of or look at as a disproportionate amount of work on a buggy jumping near a helicopter. Um, but we set up numerous uh, mini teams as we were uh, in the run-up to E3 2016 um, to, to tackle um, aspects of the, uh, the, the first 10 minutes just like that. The big jump, the bioluminescent cave, um, and a ton of other things around that, um, that experience. And what that did uh, was give us a level of polish which really shines out uh, both when the, the players were playing it at E3 and, and in the final game as well. And that's really the final takeaway. Invest all you can in polish. And again, I guess in the face of it, it seems pretty duh, obviously. Um, but I can't stress this one enough. Uh, polish is the first thing that gets pushed off the end of a schedule. And yet it is probably the most important thing in your game which will give your player a good feeling about the experience he's having or the game that he's bought. Um, polish is the thing which glues all your ideas together and makes them feel like one big idea. Polish is the thing um, which, which makes the player feel great about uh, the investment he's made, whether it's financial or just in terms of time, um, and sets that first impression that we were talking about right at the top, um, that this is a quality product. And if you do that right at the start, if you set that uh, that first impression, then the halo effect that's created around your game and the player's subconscious um, will carry you through the less polished bits, which inevitably uh, will follow. Um, there's another aspect to polish as well, particularly when you use something like E3 as a forcing function to bring your whole team together uh, with the fear factor that people are going to see your game for the first time. There is no greater forcing function than that. Um, and it's what I call the, the space race effect. Um, we did a ton of polish for E3. Um, but as with the space, uh, the space race back in the 60s, the great benefit of the space race wasn't getting to the moon. Um, it was all the trickle-down technology which came from that, which benefited everybody across the globe. It's the same with polish, and it's the same in particular with polish for E3, because we created technology to make bits of that first 10 minutes look good, which then trickled down across the rest of our game. The slow-mo effect that I just sh showed you, we didn't have before. We created it for that one jump, and now it's all the way through our, our, our game. Every time you do a big jump in the game, there's a slow-mo effect. It trickles down and makes the rest of the game better as well. So that's why I would urge you to invest all you can in polish. And when you're cutting, cut scope more than you cut polish quality. 
So that was our first 10 minutes. That's what we took to E3. We'll return to that very briefly just in a minute. Two other things went into this, uh, this experience. One was a character select, and I'm not looking for any plaudits for including a character select, although, select, although it is shameful that Horizons 1 and 2 did not have the opportunity uh, for the player to select the character which was going to represent them. We did that in 3. Um, and I'll show you it now. This is, we're back at the beach. We're just arriving at the, the festival. Now, we do a couple of things here which are probably noteworthy um, in the context of putting your best foot forward. So here we have a cinematic. Players' uh, hands are, are, are off at this stage, um, which is basically scene setting. It's establishing that you have arrived at the festival, um, that the festival is not built. Now the festival is built. Uh, and again, you can imagine that there's music playing. Uh, here in a stylish kind of sequence which basically establishes the tone of the festival, the fun you're going to have there, as well as sneakily um, illustrating some new vehicle types and some new uh, features and some new technology uh, that we'd introduced into the game. The real purpose of that video is that it's masking a load. Now, we would have had to put the player on a loading screen for probably 10, 15 seconds uh, at the end of the beach drive before we got to this section. And for me, the worst thing when I'm a, when I'm a player um, is seeing a loading screen. Um, so we had a zero, zero tolerance uh, policy uh, on load screens, uh, on stutters, on stalls, um, on anything that could break the player's immersion in the game and impression that this was a super high quality product. So here the player has selected his, uh, his character. He's also a bit of fun selected a name uh, by which he will be referred um, throughout the game. Uh, and here we just establish some of the key messages of the game. Um, the idea of the game is that you're the boss of the Horizon Festival, so we, uh, we subtly reinforce that this is your festival uh, message so that we're making that point, even when the player uh, is playing the game for the first time. And then we, we segue into uh, the buggy versus helicopter slash Jeep uh, showcase. Um, why didn't we put character select at the start? It makes more sense. You drove as nobody for the first five minutes of the game, and then you choose a character. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The, the answer, of course, uh, is that as nice a sequence as that was, it wasn't our best foot, and it wasn't forward. Um, and we felt that we could never make character select be the best experience in our game, so we moved it back. So you had the best experience before you got to, got to that point. Again, that's the application of, uh, of the putting your best foot forward philosophy. And then the final thing is a pretty short intro sequence. Um, and again, this was plan early uh, and iterate often. This was our animatic that we created in uh, December uh, of the first year of production. Um, it's pretty standard stuff. You will almost inevitably create things like this. Um, yourself, and then we matched it. We have an incredible cinematics guy uh, back at Playground called Matt Turner, who does um, lovely cinematics like this one. And we matched it pretty much shot uh, for shot. Um, and again, the purpose of this is putting your best foot forward. We want to show that this game is a high quality production, that it's, it's, it's got a great budget to it. It's got great production qualities to it. Um, it's also, I'm probably going to cut it off, but as we, um, as we progress through, it also does a very deliberate tour of all of the ecotypes uh, in our Australia map, some of which you're not going to see uh, for hours of gameplay, just to establish how varied and how diverse uh, this game is going to, meet, going to be. And it also does a great job uh, of building excitement and setting uh, the tone of the game that you're going to have fun in cars uh, with your friends. There's another thing that's happening here, but again, uh, because we're muted, you can't hear it. Um, and it's the music track. Um, music's incredibly important to, to Horizon. Um, we had one track in mind for this sequence that we really loved. It was on our soundtrack. It's by drum and bass artists uh, Fred V and Graphics, if you're familiar with them. Um, but the track was lovely, but it wasn't just right. It didn't uh, rise in the right points. It didn't drop in the right points. Uh, and what we actually did was reach out to those artists, um, and they agreed to work with us. And they ended up actually scoring this cinematic uh, basically frame for frame, uh, using that uh, track as a basis and creating basically a VIP remix um, of it. Um, and to prove it, there it is on Spotify. Um, you can go and stream it. If everyone in this room goes and streams it, then Fred V and Graphics will make literally hundreds of a cent uh, in, uh, in streaming uh, royalties. Uh, so please do do that. Um, but that was a great experience as well. I just throw that in as it's something I didn't know you could do until you ask. And we asked, and they were great, and they, um, they were great to work with. Um, so what did this achieve for us? Bunch of things. It got us on the stage at Xbox E3, which means 
Um, when we announced our games, we, we, we announced it to millions of people. Uh, and of course, if you're going to get on stage at E3, what are you going to show? You're going to show your best content. Therefore, we showed some of the stuff that we've just been talking about uh, this afternoon. Uh, and if you're showing it on stage, you're showing it to the judges at the E3 Judges Showcase. Again, this was the build that we took to E3 and the one that we put on the show floor. Uh, we had more than 25, I think, uh, stations in the Xbox booth, all playing exactly the 10-minute experience we've discussed um, today. And it was also on our ride of the show. Don't be afraid, that is not a real lion. Um, it's also in our ride of show, which is a PC 4K a pneumatic seat um, that we put in the, in the middle of the booth and which attracted huge queues. People queued for, for three hours or more to get a go. And some of them, once they had, joined the back of the queue uh, and, and started again. Um, so we had a great E3. We won a bunch of awards. Um, and that announce and the, the, the buzz that we built up around the game during that time um, served us really well because it meant we didn't have to say very much from that point on. Um, so we got back to the studio after E3 and we just worked hard on finishing the game. And when it came out, it received a fantastic reception. Uh, we're at 91 on Metacritic. We won a bunch of Game of the Year awards, a ton of racing Game of the Year awards. Um, and we feel great about that. And we have not only a game that was really well received last September when it came out, uh, but also a game which has maintained and I think built its, uh, uh, its player base ever since with a couple of expansions and a bunch of community engagement. People are still playing and loving uh, the game today. Um, and I put a lot of that down um, to the work we put into over an 18 month period uh, to create an incredibly good first impression, because that was what kept them playing. That's what made them think right at the start, this was a good game to buy. This is a worthwhile investment for me. I'm going to keep doing that. Takeaways again, put your best foot forward. Plan early and iterate often. Um, if you don't do that, sometimes you'll have to throw stuff away. That was kind of the lesson we learned the hard way uh, during that, that phase, and invest all you can uh, in Polish. Thanks so much for listening today. Uh, thank you for coming. We've got two minutes and 50 seconds if anybody wants to. Um, Thanks very much. If anyone wants to ask a question. And if you don't, we can just knock off two minutes and 36 seconds early. Shall we call it that? Great, thanks very much.